So if you ever wondered how an air conditioner or refrigerator works, because if you think about it, we've had the ability to artificially make things hotter since as long as there's been modern humans, because we can make fire, it's hot. But the ability to make things artificially cold is pretty modern and to me has always felt like an almost black magic. And I never quite understood until I started to study thermodynamics how such a thing could be possible. Because it's June in Southern California right now, and it's a nice, comfortable 70 degrees outside, but I can nevertheless have ready access to ice, which is at zero degrees Celsius, 32 degrees Fahrenheit, which is nice and cold. And as a kid, I just thought it was incredible when I found out that you could actually turn the air into a liquid and make liquid nitrogen, uh, for that matter, liquid oxygen. And it is just kind of weird that we can do things like that. And so how is such a thing possible? Well, by utilizing some principles of thermodynamics. And I'm going to explain how refrigeration and air conditioners, aka heat pumps, work. And we're also along the way going to understand some aspects of engines, because a heat pump is essentially just an engine operating in reverse, right? An engine, you take some sort of thermal energy by burning fuel or getting heat from some other source, and you turn that into mechanical work to turn a drive shaft and do something with that work, either propel a vehicle or turn an electrical generator or whatever you'd like to do with it. And a heat pump, it just is the same thing, but in reverse. You take some mechanical work and you turn a shaft, and by using some principles of thermodynamics, you can then create a heat source. You can make something hot and make something else cold. That's why it's called a heat pump, is it pumps heat from one location to another location. And so to start things off, we're going to look at this demo, what's called a Stirling engine. And here I have my little demo sized one, which operates off a very small temperature gradient from this cup of tea here. And if I just get it going a little bit, you can see that it starts moving along and it spins based on nothing but the thermal energy in this cup of little peppermint tea that I have. And you can see here, this little sort of frosted white plastic piston is what actually drives this flywheel here. It expands and then contracts, and it expands with the, when the air inside is warm, and it gets recompressed when the air inside is cold. And the bigger the difference in temperature between the hot air that expands and the cold air that compresses here, let's warm it back up with the, this is a, my coffee cup, which is a little bit warmer, although it actually just has hot water in it uh, here, just to show you that it really is running. Let me give it a very slow start and it'll speed up. And so there's two pistons in here. It's called the power piston here, which gets the power from expanding air. And then there's what's called the displacer piston, which is this black foam piston inside, which is what facilitates the power piston alternating between hot and cold. And when the power piston is at the bottom of its cycle, it, the displacer piston moves over to insulating from the cold side and so that the air inside is connected with the hot side. And when that happens, the air warms up and then the air expands when it's hot and at a higher pressure. And then the displacer piston, once the power piston is at the top of its cycle, then moves over to insulate from the hot side and connect to the cold side and then we'll have cold air and then the flywheel moves the piston around and then it compresses it when the air is cold and we have to put a little bit of work in to recompress the gas but because we're compressing a cold gas we don't have to push as hard as it pushes back when it's hot and so when the cycle is completed at the end and it is back to a cold and compressed gas and is able to heat back up, we've got more work out from the expansion than we had to put in during the compression. And so I actually have a couple of previous videos that are sort of soft prerequisites for this one. 
if you want to watch them, but if you're already familiar with the three laws of thermodynamics and the ideal gas law, you don't really need to. And I often say when talking about things like this that you can do one of three things if you aren't already familiar with those concepts. You can go watch my videos, you can go learn those things from another source, or you can just take my word for it when I say certain things, because I'm going to be relying on certain conclusions that I justify in those videos. But I am by no means the only source for, for those things, and you could just as easily go learn them somewhere else. I do recommend learning them, but if you'd rather just watch this on its own, it's intended to be a sufficiently modular video that you should be able to follow along. You're just going to have to sort of take my word for a couple of things. And one of those things is going to be the first law of thermodynamics, which is just that essentially energy is conserved and that heat and mechanical energy are the same. And it's the statement that the change in the internal energy of a gas is equal to work is, is equal to heat transfer into the system minus the work done by the system. Uh, and so anytime you compress a gas, it's gonna you're gonna do work on the system, which is negative. So the energy, you know, is going to increase, right? If I push on this plunger here in this medicine dropper while holding the end closed, I am doing mechanical work. And so I am increasing the pressure of the gas by forcing it into a smaller volume, but I'm also increasing the temperature and it's undergoing what's called adiabatic compression, which just means that there's zero heat transfer. So if there's zero heat transfer, but there is work being done on the system, then the energy has to change. So we can also have adiabatic expansion, right? That's what happens when I let go of the plunger, right? Is it pushes back and it the mechanical work doesn't do anything useful. It just gets lost to the friction in the plunger. But nonetheless, you can see where when I let go, that plunger speeds up and mechanical work is being done on the plunger. And that's adiabatic expansion because there's no heat transfer in. So to understand these different cycles and how they are used in refrigeration and in engines, we also need to understand the difference between the different types of compression and expansion and heating and cooling cycles that you can have in a well, in a gas, but in, 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 any, in any system. But we generally think about gases primarily, or sometimes mixtures of gases and liquids. But in principle, these ideas apply to gases, liquids, solids, and just about anything else, as long as you can apply the concept of thermal equilibrium to the system, which I talked about that in the past. It's kind of a lie, but we just run with it. Don't worry about it. We'll just say that something called the zero flaw of thermodynamics is true and run with it. So when you compress or expand a gas, you can do it what I, in the way I just discussed, which is adiabatically, where there's no heat transfer in or out. And then however much mechanical work you do to compress the gas, that gets added to the internal energy of the gas, which is generally going to increase the temperature. But there's also what's called isothermal expansion and compression, which are when the gas's temperature remains constant. And that is what happens when you have lots of really good thermal conductivity with the surrounding environment. And so on a microscopic level, it even makes sense too, because if you have all of the gas molecules bouncing around inside of some volume, normally if they bounce off the walls and the wall is just a perfect thermal insulator, then the molecule or atom of gas is just going to bounce off with the same energy that it, it came in at. And if it's a perfect conductor of heat, then it will get a random velocity that makes sure that on average the kinetic energy of the gas molecules is what is required to match the distribution for that particular temperature. And if one of the walls is moving, well then, it's going to be moving either towards or away from the gas molecule when it bounces off of it. And if it's stationary, it doesn't change. It just is based on whether or not it's insulating or conducting heat. But if it's insulating heat and it's moving, when the gas molecule hits it, it's necessarily going to change its velocity, if the piston is moving towards it, 
then it's going to gain some extra velocity compared to bouncing off of a, a wall that's not moving. And if it's moving away from it, it's going to lose some velocity compared to if it was bouncing off of a wall that wasn't moving. And so correspondingly, it will gain or lose a little bit of kinetic energy. So again, even at a microscopic level, it all kind of makes sense. And that's reflected here in these simulations where I have adiabatic on the left and isothermal on the right, where in the, in the adiabatic case, the gas molecules just bounce perfectly off of the walls. And when they bounce off of the moving piston, they lose a little bit of velocity because it's moving away from them. And in the isothermal case, every time they bounce off of a wall, it just gives them a random energy based off of the temperature of the isotherm. And that's generally how we model the steps of a Stirling engine. In reality, most expansion and compression of a gas is a something in between isothermal and adiabatic. But a Stirling engine we model as approximately isothermal because it has these like, you know, like these metal plates that are very good conductors of heat. So the entire time the piston is moving up and down, it's in very good contact with either the top surface or the bottom surface. And we can say that the temperature is essentially constant. And that isothermal processes are actually the easiest to model with the ideal gas law, because we can just say that if the temperature is a constant, then pressure times volume is a constant. Versus for adiabatic expansion, you actually have to do a little bit of extra work, and it works out to pressure times volume to an exponent of something called the heat capacity ratio is a constant for an ideal gas. And that just reflects the fact that the temperature is not a constant. So you can still use the ideal gas law, but you can't, in, you can't invoke PV equals a constant because the temperature is changing because you're doing work, which is increasing the energy, which is changing the temperature. I'm not going to show you why it's PV to the gamma that is much more in depth, and I'll do that maybe some other time, but that's more for my like dedicated lecture channel than for this sort of overview explanation. So you have isothermal expansion and contraction, and you have adiabatic expansion and contraction. You can also have what's called isochoric heating and cooling, and isochoric is constant volume. Iso means same, and core means volume, C-H-O-R, and that necessarily means that there's going to be heat transfer but not any work because you can't have work if there's no change in volume right the reason that gases do work when they change volume is that pressure is force divided by area and so if you have a you know a piston like this you know you have some area that the gas is pushing on and then it moves some distance at, while it applies that force, and work is force times distance, or the integral of force with respect to distance, since the force is not constant. And in order to have constant volume, you necessarily can't have any of the surfaces moving, or if they do move, they move in equal amounts, and so the force is all, you know, the sum of all the works will be zero. And so isochoric processes don't involve any work, Adiabatic processes don't involve any heat transfer. Isothermal processes involve both work and heat transfer, but with the temperature held constant. And then the final thing we have that we like to think about is isobaric processes, which is where the pressure is held constant. And in isobaric processes, you can have heat transfer, work, volume changes, and temperature changes. And the only thing that you hold constant is the pressure. But those are at least easy to calculate the work for because the pressure is not changing. So you don't have to do any calculus and do an integral. You can just multiply pressure by volume change. But again, we're not going to worry about doing integrals other than to wave our hands and say that sometimes you have to do an integral instead of just multiplying two numbers. So how does this all come together for something like a Stirling engine, or for that matter, an auto cycle engine, which is what most gasoline engines use, although that's auto O-T-T-O, not to be confused with auto A-U-T-O. Uh, it's just a coincidence. Auto is somebody's name, but the auto engine happens to be very common in small automobiles. So a Stirling engine uses a combination of 
iso first isothermal compression when the piston is going down because the displacer piston is initially insulating from the bottom so that we're having a constant exchange of heat in order to keep the temperature constant as the piston presses down. And really, it's, again, a combination of adiabatic and isothermal. But because there's good heat conduction compared to the speed at which it's compressing, really, every time heat only flows across temperature gradients. And so every time the piston compresses a little bit, the temperature goes up a little bit the same way it does in adiabatic compression. But then that heat is immediately dissipated through the top surface and the temperature drops back down. And so we say that it's an isothermal process, even though that's an idealization. Nothing is ever truly adiabatic because nothing's perfectly insulated. Nothing's ever truly isothermal because there would, wouldn't, you know, in order to be heat transfer, you need to have a temperature gradient. So, but we say that it's approximately isothermal compression. And then we move the displacer so that it's now connecting, insulating from the cold side, connecting to the hot side. And then we approximate that as isochoric heating because the displacer swings from one side to the other while the power piston is at it, the bottom of its stroke, so it's not moving very much. And again, really in a simple system like this, it's not quite constant volume and the displacer kind of starts swinging over in, as the displacer piston is hitting the bottom of its stroke, but we say it's approximately constant volume heating. And then once the gas is hot, hot, then we have isothermal expansion, which again is where we get our power, because now we have a nice hot high pressure gas doing our isothermal expansion. And you have, you know, integral of PDV with a higher temperature. And so we have PV equals a constant, but that constant is higher because the temperature is higher. And then we get to the top of the power stroke, and then the displacer swings back to insulating from the hot side, connecting to the cold side. And then again, we're going to have isochoric cooling instead of isochoric heating. And now the gas is cold, and we can go back to isothermal compression at the cold temperature, and the cycle can start over again. And that's how the Stirling engine is able to get power from every cycle that it goes through, as long as you have a hot side that's hotter than the cold side. So. That's all fine and good, but a Stirling engine is, a, it's technically not necessarily a combustion engine, and I'm just using the sort of leftover heat from warming up some water, but a Stirling engine is essentially what we would call, would call an external combustion engine or an external heat engine, and this is always a, one of these little things that I'm uh, pedantic I'm pedantic about, and it, but it's a sticking point for me that people will sometimes say that rocket engines and jet engines are external combustion engines. No, they're not. They are, in fact, still internal combustion engines, even though the flame goes shooting out the back and is outside. But the combustion, well, first of all, the combustion actually still happens inside of the engine. It's just that the exhaust provides the thrust. The reason that we call things internal combustion engines is that the combustion is inside of the gas that is doing the work versus in a Stirling engine or a steam engine, for example, the combustion or the heating comes from outside of the cylinder and outside of the gas. And that's why they started calling things like gasoline, auto cycle and diesel engines internal combustion engines is because the combustion happens inside the cylinder, as opposed to a steam engine where the combustion happens outside the cylinder and then heats up the gas or the liquid water and turns it into gaseous water, water vapor, inside the cylinder. So internal combustion engines are a little bit different, but the same principles still apply. And we're going to connect this all to air conditioners and refrigerators in just a moment, but I want to explain why compression ratio is so important in internal combustion engines, or in jet engines, it's usually pressure, it's usually referred to as pressure ratio, which I'm not going to talk too much about jet engines this time, because I want to keep these some semblance of a reasonable length. But in a piston, in a piston engine, you have 
some sort of compression followed by some sort of heating followed by some sort of expansion followed by some sort of cooling just like you do in a Stirling engine or a, or, a, or a steam engine but the cycle is a little bit different and the auto cycle and the diesel diesel cycle are fairly similar the auto cycle is isochoric heating so just like the Stirling engine you heat heat up the gas at constant volume which is what happens when the spark plug fires and the fuel burns and then you have adiabatic expansion where that hot high pressure gas is pushing on the piston to execute the power stroke and then you have what we model as isochoric cooling just like in the Stirling engine except unlike the Stirling engine or a steam engine where Exo we're actually ex we're actually going through an exhaust stroke and an intake stroke where we're not cooling off the air we're just replacing it with fresh air but it has the same effect as cooling it off except we want to get fresh air in there so that we can also get fresh oxygen in there and then we do something that's maybe not so obvious which is we undergo the compression stroke and this happens for both gasoline and diesel engines and that's not quite like the compression stroke for a Stirling engine, right? A Stirling engine is a truly closed cycle engine, right? An auto cycle, we're just modeling it as a closed cycle, but really it's bringing fresh air in every time. And so why do we bother compressing that air? Because we have to put work in to compress the air. And we get that work back, right? We, we do, the, the Stirling engine uses isothermal expansion and compression the auto cycle uses adiabatic expansion and compression right so there's no heat transfer during the expansion or compression but we have to put work in in order to compress that gas and we get that because it's adiabatic we get that work back because it just goes straight into the internal energy of the gas but why bother right why not just you know add a little bit of why not just add a little bit of fuel and then let it heat it up however much it heats it up and then undergo the power stroke from you know a lower from a lower from a lower pressure well part of the answer is right there right we get a lower pressure but it turns out you put in the amount of extra work you get it is almost or would be almost the same as the amount you have to put in but for the fact that auto cycle happens in the atmosphere right so the piston unlike a closed cycle is not pressing against itself or against nothing it's pressing against one atmosphere which the Stirling engine actually is too but it turns out that because you're going off of the difference between the pressure in the cylinder and the pressure in the atmosphere you want to have the highest possible pressure and so this is why the compression ratio, the ratio between the cylinder when it's at the end of its stroke and the lar there's the largest volume in the cylinder and the, when the piston is at the closest point and the cylinder volume is the smallest, the, the larger that ratio, the more efficient the engine is because the less of the energy is wasted just overcoming the pressure of the atmosphere. And pretty much all engines have some measure like that that determines how efficient they are. But for the Stirling engine, it's actually the difference in temperature, right? And one way or another, they run off of a temperature difference. So with no temperature difference, there will be no heat flow and no work. But it turns out you don't just get more total work as the temperature difference increases, you get a larger percentage of the heat turned into work and that's true for auto cycle and diesel cycle engines too except it's related to this ratio of the compression instead of being related to the ratio of the temperatures which is maybe not well all of thermodynamics is maybe a little bit counterintuitive but it turns out that compression ratio is really important for determining the efficiency of an engine and that's also what makes diesel engines efficient. It's that they can have higher compression ratios because as you compress a gas adiabatically, you heat it up, right? It's adiabatic compression, not isothermal compression. And it turns out eventually you will reach a point where you get the gas so hot that you'll ignite the fuel even without a spark. And so this is what they call knock in auto engines. And 
it's quite a significant problem because if you compress the gas so much that it suddenly ignites that can happen before the end of the compression stroke and you'll get heating before you want it and you'll end up sort of having a piston that's fighting the rest of the pistons when it's supposed to be just com compressing the fuel air mixture and so diesels get around this by adding the fuel after the compression stroke and that's also why they don't need spark plugs is they're injecting fuel into the adiabatically compressed gas that's already above the ignition temperature. But they also have to A, have very high pressure fuel pumps, and B, there's actually technically a little bit of efficiency loss because the fuel is getting added after the compression. That means that it actually is isobaric heating rather than isochoric heating. And it turns out having that isobaric heating results in a slightly less efficient cycle for the same compression ratio. But diesel engines can have much, much higher compression ratios than auto cycle engines because they're not limited by trying to keep the adiabatic heating below the auto ignition temperature of the fuel air mixture. So that's why compression ratio is so important for internal combustion engines. And for a Stirling engine, why the temperature difference is so important. And again, in the future, I'll talk about jet engines and why pressure ratios are so important. But it's all the same idea that you don't want to waste any of your heat. And the more you can maximize the difference in pressure and temperature between the two sides of your thermodynamic cycle, the more efficient the engine is going to be. And if you want the sort of more mathematically formal way to do this, it's that you should look at the pressure volume diagram. Because like I said, pressure work is pressure times change in volume. And if pressure is changing as the volume changes, you need to use calculus and do an integral. But you can represent this graphically, at least, as you want to find the area under the pressure volume curve. And if we have a closed cycle, then we subtract off the area under the compression under the parts where the volume is decreasing, and we add the volume under the parts where the pressure is increasing. And so the net result, if we want to find the area inside of the loop that shows the closed thermodynamic cycle. And you can sort of see that given that you have to not consider the pressure, but the pressure minus one atmosphere, assuming you're operating from atmospheric air to operate your internal combustion engine or your Stirling engine, then you necessarily are going to get more out if you increase the compression ratio, even for the same amount of heating. And a Stirling engine, you don't have to worry as much about the fact that there's one atmosphere, because if uh, if it, you operated a Stirling engine in vacuum, you would get a higher pressure difference during the power stroke, but also you would have to fight a larger pressure difference during the compression stroke. And the difference actually turns out to be a wash. So for a Stirling engine, all that matters is the temperature difference. But for an auto cycle engine, all that matters is the compression ratio. So I promised at one point, though, that I was going to explain how you can reverse one of these engine cycles to make something artificially colder. And indeed, with the Stirling cycle, you can literally just run it in reverse. Like if I force this flywheel to run in the opposite direction, I am technically pumping heat out of the room and back into this cup of hot water in my coffee cup. And it's not very efficient or very fast, but I am technically warming the water back up and cooling the room off just a little bit. Right, because now it's the same exact steps, except they're executed in the reverse order. So instead of getting work out, I have to put work in. And instead of transferring heat from hot to cold, I'm transferring it from cold to hot, which normally just does not happen, right? And technically, it doesn't happen with this either, right? Because what's going on is, like I said, isothermal expansion and compression are really mixtures of isothermal and adiabatic and so when i run it with this in reverse i am 
mechanically pushing the piston down. And I do that when it's connected to the hot sides with the displacer piston up and insulating from the room, the cold side. And then I compress it. And because it's thermally conducting, it will, as the gas heats up a little bit from being compressed, that work will get turned into heat and that heat will transfer because the air momentarily gets warmer than the water underneath it. And that pushes some heat into there. And then it moves over past the bottom of its compression stroke. And then the displacer moves and now it's insulating from the bottom. And so now the gas pushes back up on the displacer and get a little bit of that work back out, although not much, because now we're having to put a net amount of work in. And then, but, and this is the key, when that happens, the gas cools off, right? Because it, we're doing both. We're heating up the water and we're cooling off the air slash the top plate, but obviously it's the, the latter of those two that's more sort of desirable and enigmatic because you can't just do that by burning something or having some other exothermic chemical reaction, right? That really is the key, is that when you let the gas expand, it has to do some work. And when it does that, it cools off. And when it cools off while being insulated from the bottom, it's going to draw some heat in from the surrounding environment. And so on some level, refrigeration is actually pretty simple. It's just that when you take a high temp when you take a gas and you put it up to a high pressure, or technically take anything and put it up to a high pressure, but gases are the most convenient to work with. And you make sure it's at the same surround temperature as the surrounding environment, and then you let it cool off, you let it expand, it's going to cool off because the energy for it to expand has to come from somewhere and it comes from the internal energy of the gas and therefore it has to cool off and this does not violate the second law of thermodynamics because at no point does entropy which i'm not going to be talking about too much this time but at no point does entropy spontaneously decrease it does decrease on the cold side but it increases on the hot side and also that work has to have come from somewhere. So not going to get into it too much, but suffice it to say, nothing here is going to violate the second law of thermodynamics. And so by just running this little Stirling engine in reverse, we've made a little heat pump slash air conditioner slash refrigerator. Because it's pumping heat from, from the, the room into the, into the water. See, and if I, if I, if I let it, you can see that if I, if I start the flywheel running that direction, it eventually runs out of momentum because the flywheel is doing work to move heat versus if I spin it in the forward direction, it will sustain itself. And in fact, even accelerate a little bit because now it's using the temperature difference to do work again. Although not very much because it's cooled off a little bit. Like I said, it's not a very efficient heat pump and we're losing more heat. Um, to the surroundings from the fact that the ceramic is not a perfect insulator, but you can see it's still warm enough to operate the engine. So refrigerators and heat pumps are on some level as simple as just you take something, you compress it, and that causes it to heat up. And then you put it in contact with something that you want to dump that heat into which is generally just the surroundings, or sometimes if you're using a heat pump to warm something up, it's what you're trying to warm up. And then when it has spontaneously exchanged that heat until it's at the same temperature as the thing that you're dumping the heat into or trying to warm up, then you take it away from that. And then you let it, you put it in contact with something that you're either trying to cool off or that you're drawing heat from. Same thing, really. And then you let it expand and when it expands the energy to do that work has to come from somewhere it comes from the gas the gas cools off now it's colder than the thing you're drawing heat from and you can draw some heat away from that thing and you know rinse lather and repeat that's kind of all there is to it and it's just so bizarre to me that something so simple as that works but it does and more often than not we end up using 
a combination of liquids and gases to execute our refrigeration cycles because it just makes them simpler and more reliable and quieter because when you put a when you put a liquid into a high pressure and heat it up it still heats up but a lot of that work goes into the latent heat of the phase change between liquid and gas and then also that means that you can operate at somewhat you can operate at smaller temper at smaller pressure differentials and you can operate with a system that has a simpler and more reliable compressor the downside is that if you're using a gas that can liquefy at the temperatures and pressures that you can access in the system, it can also eventually solidify. And solids, the laws of thermodynamics still apply to solids, but they are rather difficult to pump through a closed loop. <laughs> and so if you want to get to really low temperatures, then you want to use uh, just a gas, and you typically actually do use a Stirling cycle or something like it to get all the way down to cryogenic temperatures, which that I always thought was some sort of black magic, but it turns out that it's uh, it actually doesn't ruin the magic for me. I still love uh, liquid nitrogen, but it's just as simple as you compress something, then you when you do that, you heat it up and then you let it expand. And if you do that with a gas that doesn't liquefy, or sorry, if you do that with a gas, yeah, if you do that with a gas that doesn't solidify at the temperatures you're trying to get to, you can get all the way down to the point where the air turns into a liquid, which is uh, pretty cool, pun intended. And refrigerators don't have the same type of efficiency. They have what's called a coefficient of performance, and that's why heat pumps are, in some sense, something that is more than 100% efficient. But again, that doesn't violate the laws of thermodynamics. It just means that the work that you are putting into the heat pump, that is energy, and that energy doesn't go into nowhere, right? Energy is always conserved. That's where the first law of thermodynamics comes from. And you will, at minimum, put the amount, the amount of work that you're putting into the heat pump, the absolute minimum amount of heat that you could put into the hot side is equal to the work that you are putting into the heat pump, right? Because the energy is not going to, like, go nowhere. It has to be conserved. But the heat pump isn't designed to just take work and turn it into heat on the hot side. It's designed to move heat from the cold side to the hot side. And so the coefficient of performance is how much extra thermal energy beyond the amount that you are putting in in the form of work ends up in the hot side and or rather it's the amount of heat pumps divided by the work and so it's always going to be greater than one right because the absolute smallest amount of energy that you could put into the hot side is the amount of work that you're putting into the heat pump and Anything that you pump from the cold side is a bonus on top of that, but it doesn't violate the thought, any of the laws of thermodynamics. Although people will sometimes point out, and it's true, heat pumps, their efficiency is based on the how large a temperature gradient they're trying to pump across. And that is a reflection of the second law of thermodynamics, because at a certain right, the if you think about it, if you if you just took two Stirling engines, or if you took two Stirling engines and hooked them up to the same drive shaft and you used one as an engine and the other as a heat pump, you would necessarily, in order to not violate the second law of thermodynamics, the as the first as the one running as an engine got less efficient from the thermal reservoir getting cooler, the one pumping heat would have to get more efficient. Otherwise, you would be able to violate the second law of thermodynamics. And so people will sometimes point out that if you have a heat pump that you use to war warm up a, a house in the winter, that it gets less efficient the colder it is outside. What they neglect to mention is that the power station gets more efficient <laughs> the colder it is outside, although the power station operates at such ludicrously high temperatures that the weather outside doesn't make that big a difference. But that also is why heat pumps are so efficient is because power stations can, you know, the the engine block in a car 
you know, you can only make it so big and heavy before the car becomes impractical. A power a power station ain't going nowhere, right? You can make it as big and heavy as you want, and you can have much higher operating pressures and temperatures inside. And so the coefficient of performance for a heat pump does not violate the second law of thermodynamics, but there is a sense in which they are more than 100% efficient. But of course, the power plant is less than 100% efficient, but you're still overall kind of winning over burning the fuel at, uh, at, at the location that you want heat pumped at most of the time. With several caveats, I, there's a, a bunch of good videos about why heat pumps are the best thing since sliced bread, and you should use one for your heating and cooling. The, the main reason is just that you get an air conditioner for free, so why, if you want an air conditioner, why not also use it for heating? Uh, because, again, it will be better than most other forms of heating. And you can have it for free if you want to an air conditioner anyways. Or almost for free, because the reversing equipment doesn't take much. There's a good, uh, what is it, there's the, yeah, the technology connections guy is always ranting about how great heat pumps is, but uh, to be quite honest, he's right. <laughs> they are fantastic. So, yeah, that's the uh, remarkable, unremarkable conclusion, is that how do you make things colder? Well. You just let gases and liquids expand, <laughs> and because of the conservation of energy, they have to get colder. But that hopefully provides an explanation as to why it's so important to have these high differences in pressure and temperature in order to make an engine efficient, and why the that actually, I, as one final aside, should mention that's why the coefficient of performance of a heat pump is proportional to the temperature, but it's also proportional to the pressure difference that the system can maintain, and also proportional to a few other things, like if you do have a phase change, that boosts the efficiency, and again, it makes the system quieter, simpler, more reliable, because you don't have to have uh, as high pressure of a compressor, and it's you don't have to have as it's easier to use just a single compressor, and instead of having to have an actual expansion cylinder, you can just put the liquid through a needle valve. They, technically, you can do that with a gas, too, but it's not as efficient. So, anyways, hopefully that made sense. Uh, please do let me know if you have any questions. I guess you can put those in the comments. Uh, I will eventually be tying this into how the efficiency of jet engines works, uh, and especially how that ties into ramjets and why compression is so important for jet engines and how ramjets take advantage of shock waves to get high pressure ratios. And so I'll be doing that in the future. Uh, so I guess uh, keep a lookout for that. So uh, yeah, I guess uh, thanks for watching. Bye.